Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last Beyond the Line of the year. We're in Canada, just outside Quebec City, in the most historic World Cup venue of them all, Mont Saint Anne. And what's more, it's World Cup finals time. All the overall World Cup winners are coming in at the show today to chat to us, and we're going to be saying a very, very special goodbye to the greatest of all time, to Greg Minard. Before that, though, I think we better start the show perhaps with a congratulations. Emily, I didn't like to ask at the last show, have you got one in the oven? Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not my most optimal body composition for race weight You're at glowing. the moment. You're glowing. You look lovely. Oh, thank you. Yeah, congratulations, thank you. Emily. Congratulations. Wonderful. Thank you. Baby is kicking. There's like there's a healthy RPM happening in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> you you need a healthy RPM in your life. <laughs> That's oh, for <gosh>. sure. <laughs> yeah, so baby's due in, in February. Thank you. Amazing. And Elliot, you know, isn't it amazing? Of so many memories when you walk around this place. Best tracks in the world as well. This venue's got it all. Oh, uh, for sure. I, I totally agree. It's like some of the best tracks, some of the most difficult tracks to be here in autumn. That It's so beautiful here. Yeah. Mount St. Anne has great memories for all of us. It certainly does. Well, let's get into it then. Here's Elliot's favourite moment of 2024. This has to be everyone's favorite moment. This was Leger this year in the downhill. I mean, on one hand, you saw all this carnage, you know, oh. not too many people having really big crashes, but the creativity that came out, you know, to for people to adjust on the fly, to take the B line, just when you thought maybe people wouldn't be able to make it down, you saw Amory Piron throw down this incredible run, Greg Menard, Bernard Kerr. Yeah. So I think it just shows how difficult these downhill tracks are <laughs> yeah, when it does is. rain. For sure. Yeah, 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 definitely. But, but as you said, you know, sometimes the worst can bring out the best. And some of the riders that did nail that section was, it was absolutely speechless to see. Outrageous, it? outrageous. It was. And talking about outrageous and brilliance brings me nicely to talk about our guest, Greg Minar. Hard to believe, really. He started his first World Cup race, was in 1997. It's been coming a while, man. He's like 42 years old, 43 in November, still at the very top of World Cup racing on podiums. And this is it. Like, we're going to say goodbye to him today. I don't know how you feel. For me, I'm, I'm emotional. I don't mind admitting it. For sure. I mean, we have a, we have a really special video. I think, I like, for the first time I, I saw it, I, I definitely choked up. And I think that he is so much more than just a downhill racer. And I'm so glad to hear, hear Rob for us because from the GOAT of commentary, we have you introducing the GOAT of men's downhill. Take a look. Greg Minar. In 1997, you raced your first downhill World Cup. In the 27 years that have followed that, you've accumulated a points total of 19,434 World Cup points. You won your first World Cup downhill race in Capruin in 2001. And in the 166 starts since then, you went on to win another 21 races, making you the most successful male downhiller of all time with 22 downhill World Cup wins to your name. Oh, and let's not forget that half those starts finished on the podium. You've been a four-time world champion, punctuating each of the last three decades with that title. Your first in 2003 and your last in 2021 at 39 years old. This is your 27th start here in Mont Saint Anne and heavily rumored it might be your last. You first raced here in 1998, you won here in 2008 and you finished second here no less than six times. But my friend, you are so much more than those numbers that make you easily the greatest of all time. You're an absolute gentleman. You're someone that we can all look up to. And one thing's for sure, there will never ever be another Greg Minar. And here he is with us now then. Man, those stats are just, every time I hear them, just blow my mind. It's amazing to have you in here, Greg. The retired Greg Minar, I mean, What's it feel? How are you feeling today, mate? How, how is it for you? Day one. Day one, I woke up, had a chat to my wife, got out of bed, went for brunch, and I went for bacon, maple syrup, and pancakes. And Extra I just loved butter. It. <laughs> Everything. Uh, you know, I'm just like gonna, I'm probably gonna balloon, come through the butterball. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's good. But it's a uh, flip it. it. Where'd you get these stats from? Where did the 19,000 points come from? Your website. <laughs> Norco website, <laughs> yeah. It was all laid out there, don't you worry. Oh, but, cool. I mean, the career you've had will never be repeated. I guess it, the decision to actually quit and actually make you quit, it's been hard to get this over the line, right? I mean, you keep putting it off. <laughs> this year, you've been on the box, second in a World yeah. Cup again. That can't have helped you. This weekend, I think beating Bruni probably did help you, right? <laughs> get it over yeah, the line. Yeah, I mean, but... it was... Uh... 
To be honest, yesterday's race was tough. And it was, in, it was a lot harder condition than I, than I anticipated. And it's one of the race runs I'd love to repeat. I just didn't really feel myself. And so I said to my wife at the bottom, <laughs> I'm coming back to do this one again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, hey, that's not the case. Uh, you know, I think what's made it really um, easy has been backed by such a great company. When, when, when Norco are, so, are backing me into, and seeing the vision that I have going forward and understand it, makes it a lot easier. You know, it's never going to be an easy transition um, from going from professional sport to uh, everyday living. No, no, it's becoming a civilian, especially yeah. when basically <laughs> your entire life almost... Yeah. I mean, how, how old were you when you got that special dispensation in 97 to race in Stellenbosch? Yes, yeah, so I was 15. So you've, wow. you're, you, you haven't really missed a season apart from injury since then, right? That is yeah. The World Cup has been everything, isn't it? It has, yeah. I mean, I missed a couple of races, but I've pretty much been at every... Uh, if, you know, most 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 seasons, you know, I've, I, I don't, I haven't missed a full season. Wow! So Do you have a couple of moments when you look back and you're like, man, this location, this race, like, what are the things that stand out to you over the course of the last, you know, couple of decades? Uh, I mean, winning at home was great. Uh, so winning in South Africa, that was amazing. The world champs. The world champs. That had to yeah. be something special, right? It, it was great, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't an amazing. It's one of the races that was was a highlight for sure, but it, um, as an experience, it was, it was super stressful, and I, I had to win. The, they made dad... music for you. You were yeah. like the whole town was around. I had to yeah. win. No, you one. had to win. There was no. So one like that after party, there wasn't much. At, you know, <laughs> uh, that wasn't. Much. But then, Val de Sol, yeah, the toughest track, stacked field. Winning there was just incredible. At Thirty-nine that years old. Yeah. That that, yeah, that, that I was mean, great. Well, we commentated on that. That was. Stupendous. We couldn't. That yeah, was. That no. shouldn't have happened. No. We, I mean, <laughs> no. Not, and that's just testament to your absolute natural ability and brilliance as a bike rider. Like as a, that. That no one can win in Val de Sole at the. Not even a World Cup, but not Val de Sole or World sure. Championship there. That was that. That really. Yeah, that put it there for me, mate. That did. That was insane. Yeah. Yeah. I think as a cross country rider, I see it in cross country, but also downhill. And it appears like it's becoming a little bit more of a young man's sport. I don't want to totally put that claim out there but I mean winning worlds in 21 that would have put you at 38 and I've talked with my fellow racers at like 20 or 31 32 we start to feel our edge go when it comes to like our nerve with the technical side of things but how do, what do you mm. attribute to to have it like maintaining that speed all this time I don't know I haven't I haven't lost the nerve to like try and send a big gap or to find something technical technically and or uh, going really, really fast. Yeah. Because I mean, that gets quite scary as well. <laughs> that, that side hasn't really bothered me. I, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the workload. It's trying to recover, trying to um, be stronger. Um, Do you that notice the difference harder. as you get older? That's because well, you, it's, look, it's, you look like you're about 21 years old <laughs> still. Like, I, I haven't found it's hard. I've just found it's a time thing. You know, you, you're busy all day. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm signing up new riders for next season. I'm, I'm writing contracts. I'm, I'm preparing for that. But I'm also training and trying to recover. And, and life's busier when you get older. Yeah. Um, you know, and now I've got a wife and, you know, and all these other things. It's, uh, I feel like it's a lot of work. So that's been, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, but, you know, I, 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 I hit the deck pretty hard this year in Fort William. And uh, you did right at the start. It was one. probably the worst start that you could have Obviously, ever had this year. Oh, yeah. oh, my goodness. And so I separate my shoulder in this first crash. But the competitiveness in me says, get back on the bike and keep racing. Mm. That's what I was taught when I raced motocross. My dad would, you know, get back up and keep racing till the end. Yeah. So I get back up and I go down this drop and my shoulder just gives in. There's nothing I could do. And so I have another massive crash. So I get to the bottom and, you know, I'm trying to, like, break it down. And I go, you know what? Actually, my uh, body's a bit tougher than I thought. You know, 43 years old, I can actually handle a few big dingers. So that's cool. Um, so, so that, like, that set the tone. You know, you, you sometimes have a big crash and it kind of scares you. But, and and that didn't, I wasn't fearful of that. But I was just I was hurt and injured. So um, that was a problem. This season... Yeah separated shoulders to try and ride through. I knew if I went and had surgery, I, I wouldn't make the season. And that's not how I wanted to end it. Yeah. And so... Uh, it actually was on. It was on. So I managed to get a... I managed to, to um, try and ride through the pain. And I felt like, you know, the, the testing... When you're testing a, a new bike, like, you go to all these test tracks. They're not World Cup tracks. The World Cup tracks are a lot faster. And 
I felt like if I need to keep developing this bike, I need to back, keep racing and, and keep going through the World Cups and use them as, as development races um, while I try and heal the shoulder. Um, and, and so that was a bit tough this year. Yeah. Um, can you um, tell us like about this role? Because a lot of it, like you said, like this year was almost a transition year. You were racing, yeah. but you were also getting ready for next year. So what mm -hmm. is going on next year? We want to be one of the, the top three, four teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're pushing from like a, a technical side and uh, as well as from like track side. We, 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 want, to, we bring, want to bring in elements that, that uh, are different to other teams. And, and give the riders more data and more knowledge to know that where they're going is in the right line, right place, the bike setup is, is just perfect. So that's where we're pushing it. It excites me, I love product development, I love getting involved in it on both sides. And uh, so that's where I'll be directing the team. And, and so we, we, we're hiring younger riders and uh, to continue pushing this forward. I mean, we had a great day yesterday. Yeah. You know, Kirk McDonald, I think it was 16th oh, in the men. And then Gracie was second. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that was great. Like, we, I think we were third in the team, team ranking, you say? Oh, so that yeah. was super cool. You can cool. see already your influence. Like, like, I said to you, didn't I? I said, we were outside the pit, and I was like, I'm liking what Norco's looking like. Big yeah. brand, it's, a good it's cool, mate. It yeah. looks amazing, it's, it's it does. Yeah, you know, I like my stats. So you had 22 <laughs> downhill World Cup wins. You did have a four cross win in Fort William as yeah. well, so it's yeah. actually 23 World Cup wins. Right. We were told <laughs> that you're the only man in history to ever score a point. You did it here in Mont Saint Anne oh. in all disciplines in one weekend. <laughs> downhill, four cross, and cross country. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I, 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 I heard Martin Whitey talk about it last night. <laughs> yeah, and, that's uh, where it came from. You know, in global racing, they had this like strong training push. And I, I want to say he offered up like a thousand bucks to ever. Whoever was the fastest male in the cross country or the fastest female in the cross country. And so we all took to line and Sean McCarroll, as you know, was in there. Yeah. And I remember we started, it was on the, on the far side of Monson and went up this like really technical climb. And it was like backlog, because we started on the back row. And uh, all these cross country guys all polite and they all wait their turn to walk up this muddy hill. And there's McCarroll up in the bush just ramming his bike into the front. <laughs> I think he got out like 20th place or something. Yeah. You know. But uh, yeah, there was a guy, Cadell Evans. Remember Cadell yeah, Evans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ended up beating went him. On to win a <laughs> beat him. Went on to win the tour. He did. And uh, I beat him that day. I think I was 63rd. Did you really? He pulled out. So, <laughs> so it was like technical downhill work. man by an order tour. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. we were lucky to get you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing, I, one thing I heard this week that I'd forgotten about actually, like we look at these stats, these incredible stats. You didn't have that many injuries, really. Well, no, you've had hardly any injuries for the amount of races mm. you started. Sure. But you did have that niggling shoulder injury, right? Mm. And I remember you. You, you kind of there was a, there's a bit of a period in in your career where there are less results. Yeah. And you had that shoulder fixed, and boom. And I remember it's you totally telling good. me I can ride a bike again. Like you just had it was dislocating all the yeah, time. Yeah. So I, do you wish you'd had it done sooner? Maybe we would have well, seen because it went on for a few years. It's right. I've been thinking about this year because you always go like, oh, I could have done this better. Can, you know. And, yeah. Back on the bike next yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was. Then I won the World Cup here in Montana in 2001. And um, on, um, on Global Race. Yeah, on the Orange. On the Orange. Yes. And um, they put on this invitation race in, in France. And it was a picture of myself and a picture of Nicolas Vuglio on this technical, gnarly track. And uh, so I get invited to this race to like have this head to head. And I was practicing with a, a friend of mine, David Vasquez, and yeah. I'm having a crash. And I put my arms out and I get up and I'm like, oh, I think I've broken my collarbone or something. And, Trying to like suss it out, so my shoulders like in front of my chest. <laughs> so I'm like, hey David, can you just have a look and see what's going on? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Doctor he David. just looks at it and turns and rides down the downhill. <laughs> so I wait for this doctor to come, and uh, they're trying to put my shoulder in, couldn't go in, and eventually they, they put me on some I don't know, some kind of drug, and it goes back in, and and so all the way through my 20s, I was battling with this dislocating shoulder, and uh, I, I remember again in Montanay, Sam Hill. Uh, racing against Sam and uh, my shoulder dislocates yeah. mid-run yeah. and I start swinging it to get it back in oh. like, and it's not getting back in. Oh my goodness. So then still I going fast at this time? Well, I'd like now I'm sitting <laughs> and so now I've got my um, hand on the brake and I'm trying to slow down to peel off the track to get off the track oh. and as I get to the tape it goes back in so I swerve back on and start pedaling back up to me and I finish second. So you finished second? I ended up second then. What? 
And so... What, actually putting your own shoulder in or yeah. the run? That's like, here we go. These so, are the stuff you don't hear about. So this all happened through my, like, 20s. And then it yeah. was Fort William 2007, World Champs. And, you know, love Fort William. I love racing there. Yeah. And... Um, Did you win it seven times? I, yeah, I think so. I'm not sure. <laughs> Just man. I, I really, really, don't really know the stats, to be honest. Uh, I can have a quick dig if we want, but it's about <laughs> seven or eight. <laughs> Give or take a couple. And so it's World Champs for William. I'm all geared up on the Honda. Um, oh, my shoulder Honda. was all taped up. So they ran this, like, external tape to hold my shoulder from dislocating. And I get into that woods and I make a bit of a slip and I go over the bars. And still trying to hold onto the handlebars while I flip. The external tape, um, stops my shoulder dislocating out the front, but anyway, my shoulder dislocates out the back and it breaks the scapula. What? But now I'm like in that middle mid forest. I get back up on the bike. Dad's voice in my ear. Keep racing. <laughs> Thanks. Dad. So I get on this bike and I start hammering it down to that finish line. Uh, well, still got a bit of way to go, you know, down the old nowhere. And I get to the finish line. I come in fourth, and I'm wow. like gutted, you know, world champs, no podium, uh, and I'm like, yeah limping out the, the finish area and a friend pats me on the back and he's like, ooh, um, I think there's a problem with your back because you've got like something sticking out. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, trying to have a look and so basically my shoulder dislocated uh, exterior. Wow. At the back, yeah. broke the scapula. So the scapula was like winging out. So I go to the hospital, have an argument with the doctors because they say that it's dislocated posterior and I'm going, it's definitely not because I know how to get that back in. And so I knew the team was collapsing then, and, and so uh, I had to make the team dinner. And all I wanted to get there, so I just said, just give me this laughing gas and let's put the shoulder back in, I need to get to dinner. And uh, they eventually did, managed to get in. And that was the end of my shoulder. My shoulder was completely wrecked. Um, so but, you had no choice. But back then, there was no real surgery to fix it. You know, it's like, you'd heard of like horror stories from motocross riders who'd have this very similar thing. And, they wouldn't be able to, there's no surgery that we could yeah. fix it. You know, they'd try and pull the bicep and wrap it around. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. successful. Yeah. Um, so you were wary of having it done and ended up with uh, something unsuccessful that had taken a year out. Exactly. Yeah. So I ended up, I had to go for surgery and they, they reconstructed my whole shoulder. And, uh, and that was into 2009. That's when Rob Roscoe took the chance, took the gamble of me going over to the syndicate. Yeah. And uh, with a new shoulder. A <laughs> well, with a new shoulder, it worked out pretty good. Yeah. So. You, you've raced, you know, like almost. You've raced almost entirely every kind of decade of downhill, right? You did. You started in the 90s. I mean, that's mm -hmm. when it started. Who, where would you have the fondest memories? Is there an era? And, and who, of everyone you've raced, who was your nemesis? Who was your gnarliest rival? Ah, uh, there's, there's been a few. It'd be hard to... Of course know. there has. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You, raced, mean, you would have even raced Vuyo, right? Well, I was head-to-head -head with Vuyo in 2001, yeah. I remember that. It's just like... unbelievable, and you're still here in 2024. <laughs> you raced Vuyo, you were head-to-head -head with Vuyo. Yeah. yeah, I, I mean, remember that's I was, just madness to was, listen to that. I was 28 points behind him coming into to Montanan, and uh, I caught up 10 points in the, in the semi-final or whatever it was, and I had to beat him in the final. And uh, I had this rock drop that I could do, and he couldn't. I think I was the only rider who did it. And uh, I managed to do it and beat him. Chris Kavarik beat me on the day, but I managed to beat Nico. So. <laughs> yeah, that was always a nice I one. remember seeing him in the morning and we're in this rock garden trying to suss out a line. And I was, you know, just one of my heroes, you know? And I was like, hey, how's it going? And I just got this, like, death stare back. It's like, oh, it's pretty serious today, <laughs> I guess. But, you know, I was a happy-go-lucky kid. I, you know, and I just found myself in a lucky situation. Huh. Yeah, I think there's been a bit, there's there's not that much luck about your career, Greg. <laughs> anyway, there's plenty of love for you, of course, in this room, and there was plenty for you around the pits. I kind of that I first saw Greg race in 2004. What year are we in now? <laughs> 2024. Holy sh! No. Boy's been around for a long time. I mean, our first World Cup was the year I was born. <laughs> He's been racing World Cups longer than I've been alive. So, oh, I'm 25. I think this is his 25th season, isn't it? Throughout his career, they've all come along. We've had this, you know, new generation of faster riders, and Greg's always been able to adapt. He's all the guys in one. Uh, it could be the nicest friend. It could be the dickest friend, making the funniest joke. Like, he's everything is the whole package. And then you can break, and then... 
it's unreal the amount of consistency he's had for such a long time to be at the top of the sport. Definitely a big help as uh, you know being his teammate in the last two years. Just to like you know learn as much as I can from him. You know the the good and bad. He's been through it all, right? So. One of the first things I noticed about Greg was just how much detail he goes into on the bike. He kind of really doesn't leave a, a stone unturned on the bike. That mentality of always striving more, 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 more enabled him to be at the top for as long as he has. He puts everything into racing, even if he's had a big night before. Unreal to be doing that at 43 years old. Proves to win races because he can do everything. So yeah, he's uh, the GOAT. Probably for me, the most memorable race win for him would have been Val de Sol uh, World Championships. I can't see anyone else matching that. Like, how are you going to win the World Championships in downhill mountain biking at 40 years old? That's something else. Yeah. Unreal, the career that he's had. Really cool to be able to share some of that, some of his journey with him and uh, kind of learn a little along the way, you know? Very sad to see him go, but I think, you know, he has had such an amazing career that, you know, I think he should be very proud of where he's at. Well, plenty of amazing tributes there, of course, you know what I mean, right? what you're going to expect. But one thing, you know, that Wynn touched on there was his bike set up. Would you yeah. put that down to some of your success? Because I don't think there's anyone quite as fussy, might be the word I'd use, <laughs> about their bike set up. Are you really... I mean, it's a skill, it's hard right? It's being tall. Huh? I mean, you would know, it's hard being tall. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. On, I on mean, those bikes you were riding there, it's laughable, funny. like, 10 yeah, years yeah. ago. Yeah. So you move a handlebar, like, a degree, the sweep changes so much, yeah. and you feel it being tall, you know? Like, I'd love being shorter. I was over at the Norco Pits yeah. this morning, actually, just checking out the bikes and the one that they're yeah. raffling off and all your, your titles you'd won. But what about the, the era when you finally switched over from... Uh, up to 29-inch yeah. wheels, oh, yeah. evolution of that, that jump. Yeah, that was, um, that was a bit rushed, you know. Uh, and it's really hard. It's like, and we, you know, I was, we weren't the first to do it. I'd seen it before, but it's, it's one of those things like, you, there's no point making a 29-inch um, bike if you can't get a 29-inch downhill tyre or you can't get a 29-inch yeah. a, a downhill wheel or fork. Yeah. So um, it, it was like a, a group effort from, like, Maxis to Fox to um, Envy at the time. And then Rob Ross got believing that, you know, where I wanted to take this, you know, it was Rob that kind of got it across the line. You know, I, being a rider, you say, hey, Maxis can just remould some 29 inch tires, you know, or it's not yeah. going to happen. But when Rob Ross got backs you in it, it, it gets done. So that was quite interesting because we, I'd asked for this bike and we kind of got to testing in December and it, it hadn't been done. You were running um, tubulars at one point, weren't you, on the Santa Cruz? It, it, that was one of Rob's crazy ideas. I never yeah, it, but you were on the... You always he, he tried it. Yeah, he tried yeah. It. Um, and, and so I wanted this bike, and, and we managed to kind of take a, an existing frame and, and just mould up a, a swing arm in time for the season. Huh. And uh, we kind of got ahead of, ahead of everyone else because we'd really been testing the 29. Everyone was going, if you go a bigger wheel size, you can, you can go to, like, 180 more travel. Mm. And in testing on our first day, we're like, no, we need to go back to two, 210 and at least uh, two or three on the fork. And uh, when everyone rushed in that season to try and make these 29 inch bikes, yeah. we all made them 180 and it didn't, didn't work. You know, and they came up with a compromise of going into the mullet. So that's uh, um, what we're on now. But uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a good experience. Yeah, man. Greg, uh, it's interesting, you know, one of the things you were talking about in your new role is, is looking for talent and you've seen so many of the best young riders come up from Loic. I mean, Jackson right there. Yeah. What, what has been the evolution of, of talent? Like, has there been different mindsets for these kids coming up? Mm. Uh, what have you seen there? Yeah, we didn't touch, Rob asked earlier, like, who are the guys that I um, looked at, like, the, the toughest competitors? And I think it kind of goes with, with the new era. It's, things have changed, you know. I grew up racing cross country, downhill on the same bike, and all I used to do is take the bar ends off for downhill. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's hard to... That's how yeah, it was. That's how it was. And yeah, exactly. now you grow up on a downhill bike like Jackson, you know, in a, in a park. In a bike park. Another and, evolution. Yeah. yeah. And, and these guys just ride with so much more confidence. Um, and, and so, yeah, when you look back at, like, the riders, you know, some of my toughest competitors, Sam Hill. Yeah. Great racer. Yeah. Aaron Gwynn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he had, like, a... He could just pick up the pace and he changed you know yeah. the way we race you know back in the nico area era 
we'd also have like a little bit more pedaling. So in the track, you'd hammer a technical section, you'd get onto like a fire road or whatever, and you'd kind of sit, spin the legs out, and then hammer the next section. Yeah, that's right. Then with the Aaron's era, it was just like this it's a fitness intense, yeah. intense just run from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And then Lewis continued that, and now you've got this um, young age of riders who have this intensity, but also if they're offline, they just lean the mark and shrop and get back online and off they keep going. You know, if I'm get offline, I'm like foot out, <laughs> yeah. get all stiff and rigid. You guys just swing it in and keep going like that. Yeah. But you still are competitive, even <laughs> retired. I mean, that's what's mad to see you come out and get a second this year. You know, and after a broken neck as well, a massive injury oh, yeah. late in your yeah, it's true. I mean, it's like talking about fear. Mm. No one, no one, Greg has gone. Who would be the closest to you, Petey? I suppose winning a world championship was he 36 or something? I mean, Is he, yeah. Something like that, but no yeah, one's. He was yeah, no that. one has even come close to the age you've still been really competitive. Of, and we have got to leave it there. And we could definitely sit here and talk to the goat for the rest of the day, can we? It's absolutely amazing. Congratulations, Greg, thanks, on Rob. just what has been an unbelievable career, mate. And it is sad it's over, but hey, thanks it. a lot. I mean, after yeah. last night, I thought Elliot was retiring, <laughs> but it was actually my retirement. But thanks you for having what? me on I, the show. I can still beat you at a couple things. <laughs> Hey, you beat Bruni yesterday. <laughs> well, it's not just the overall winners that get a prize on this show. Earlier in the week, we sent Elliot to find Pom Pom. This one is easy. Our comeback of the year goes to Miriam Nicole. Miriam's had some massive injuries over the years, but a concussion took her to a place where she thought she may never compete again. For her to come back physically and mentally to get a second place in Leo Gang, do one better, stand on top of the podium in Lunevier, it's one of the best sporting moments we've seen in downhill, and it couldn't have happened to a more deserving person. She's doing an interview right now, so we're gonna go in, interrupt her, surprise her a little bit, and uh, get her reaction. All right, we've got something more important going on here. <laughs> Miriam, we at Beyond the Line, we have a little award for you. We wanted to surprise you. We just were, we were super proud of, of like everything that you were able to accomplish this year. So we uh, wanted to give you comeback of the year. Thank you. Comeback of the year. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's yeah. so cool. Hey. Can you just kind of recap what it meant for you to stand on the podium, you know, at Leo Gang, but then also getting the win? Yeah, I mean, that was so emotional. And like I said before, not being able to exercise until Fort William being able to do a World Cup again, being on the on the podium again in Leo Gang and winning Ulu Danville was just like, it feels like a dream even today. So I'm super proud and I feel there is something so natural and I've been so well surrounded by really good people and a good mountain bike family that gave me lots of love. So it's uh, super good and I'm, I'm stoked on this. You know, <laughs> what a comeback. <laughs> you, you. <laughs> I keep it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, what a comeback indeed. I mean, a year out for Miriam Nicole, you know, a woman who has had so many big injuries. Of course she has. She's 34 years old. But we saw that emotion from her in Lea Gang when she got back on the podium. I mean, it was unbelievable spilling out of her after what she'd been through. To win after that? What do you make of that, Emily? To oh, come I... back like that? Yeah, I think once she once she overcame her first couple injuries at that point, it's that unknown, but also, OK, I've already done this a few times, so let's throw some cards in the basket and hope for the best. But uh, she's proved that. Yeah, I always think it's interesting when you have moments like that where you see a bunch of emotion spilling out and it's mm. kind of, as an audience member, it feels a little bit unexpected. And then when you kind of hear the behind the scenes yeah. where you're like, man, the, the stuff that you have to overcome as an athlete is just insane sometimes. And the behind the scenes for Miriam were literally like, you might not race again. Yeah. So yeah. to come back, it's a podium to win. That's a, yeah, brilliant. Right prize, eh? For sure. We better talk about another French woman as well who delivered here in Mont Saint Anne, Marine Cabarou. I mean, what, she's an, um, we, she flies a little under the radar, Elliot, but she is amazing, huh? That's what I noticed straight yeah, away. She's sure. kind of that athlete that isn't maybe everyone's first choice when they think of the World Cup wins, but I mean, she did win the overall back in 2020. So yeah, that's right. She is that that's bit right. of a dark horse, so really impressive this weekend. Yeah, I, I always feel the same way. Like, 
I mean, even for all of us, it's not like we had her in our predictions exactly. or anything like that. And um, she's been yeah, away right. with injury a little bit, but that was her that was her ninth win. Puts her equal with Tani Seagrave. She's now only one off Miriam Nicole, who's got ten along with Valley. So she's right That's there with easy, the biggest right? names currently racing in this sport. There's no argument of that. Yeah. 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 And when she's on, she's hard to stop. Oh, it's 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 for sure. I mean, we've seen over the years of her put down some runs that just blow everyone outside of the water, you know? Yeah, no Absolutely. longer the dark horse. No. Well, there was a lot of chasing going on this year, but no one could catch the Austrian arrow that was on its way to another bullseye. And we are now joined by the back-to-back -back world champion and World Cup overall winner, fresh off her race run, Valentina Hull. Thanks for coming in, Valley. Thank you. Congratulations on the last two years. That looked like a bit of a tricky one a day up there in Mont St. Annie, was it? I was a little bit slippery. It did look it, but you looked like you nailed the rock section. Was it? What was your run like? Oh, it was wild. At the top, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go for the win, and then I nearly died two times. <laughs> so I was like, OK, I'm going to break a little bit more and take it safe. And... I don't want to be injured and uh, on the beach with a cast or something. <laughs> and here is that rock section. How slippery was that today? The riders before you looked like they made it look almost impossible. You made it look pretty easy, actually, if I'm honest. Well, I don't That's know, true. it didn't feel that easy. <laughs> I, was like... no. <laughs> I was like, just don't break too hard and uh, just get down. By that time, I didn't really feel my hands anymore, so it's just like, I don't really know what I'm doing. But... That's one thing that hasn't changed <laughs> since 1993 yeah. or four when I first came here. You can't feel your hands even still now. The physicality of this place, but, you know, it's been an amazing couple of years for you. You've won everything. Do you feel like you finally kind of got to where you needed to be in the sport? Because when you started, you've only been elite, what, three years, four years now? I think it's actually my fifth elite season. Is it? Yeah. Sorry. All right. <laughs> five, five. I'm old. But, yeah, you're yeah, not the only one. But, like, you know, the, the pressure on you when you came in as an elite rider was, tan it was you know, tangible. You could feel it. But, like, you, you've delivered, haven't you? It must be a good feeling to live up to all those, uh, that expectation. Well, oh, it's mad. I mean, uh, I mean, I have 10 World Cup wins already in Elite and, and all those titles, like... Mm. When I was a little girl, like, I wrote down World Champion on a little piece of paper and, and now I am three-time World Champion, so oh. I don't really know how that happened. It was just a really natural progression and I feel like now, yeah, I do feel confident when I show up at the World Cups and I know I'm no, no underdog and there may be people looking up to me, so that's really cool. I mean, Emily, it looks to me like the confidence really shows in Valley's riding now. Yeah, right? I'm curious. You said when you were a little girl, you wrote that as your manifestation. Have you readjusted? Like, where do you go from here? What do you want to do next? <laughs> well, at the moment, everyone is asking me that because I've backed up all the titles from last year. So there's nothing really bigger I can still achieve in our sports. Maybe I can wait until our sport is in, you know, in the Olympic Games. But I don't really wait for this. Like. I think I will try to do more projects that come up in my mind, like maybe do a bit more free ride, will maybe you? try hardline, you know, give it That's a go. That's been a big rumor, Valley. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah, I mean, I get asked quite a lot, but I always have a good excuse not to go. But I feel like now, <laughs> now I have to face it, and I think uh, it will be sick. Like it will be a good time. It's a big progression for you, like yeah. you know. And is there a bit of you that recognizes that some of the women are doing it, and do you feel that you should be there? Oh, for sure, like. It's sick to see Lou Ferguson like going to Tasmania or like even Gracie, you know, and they're all on the podium. So I know it's possible and it's sick for the sport. I feel like they're pushing really hard, but I also want to be a part of that free ride side maybe and not only in racing because I Ooh, do right. feel like we can do both. Like mm. Rob, you had a crazy stat just about uh, Rachel and Valley, like the wins that they had coming into the sport and at, at this point. Do you remember that? Like yeah, I can't remember the exact numbers, but, like, in three years to get 10 World Cups is super impressive, isn't it? And, I mean, we know that Rachel's on 40 and Caroline, the most winningest World Cup ever racer, is 41 down in World Cup wins. Is that on your mind? Is that something you're going to go for? Because as we go to 10 races next year, it might be a little bit more in reach than it was before. 
Oh, it's a tough one because I don't really see myself racing for the next 12 years. <laughs> you know, they're all like 33, 34. I'm 22 now. Like, as I said, like, I've seen it all so far. I mean, I still love the sport and stuff, but I don't really see myself racing in when I'm 32. But who knows? Maybe time goes by super quick. Valley, it's interesting to hear you like talk about where you came from, like that manifestation, and me looking at your career. It, um, I would love to know like where you think you've improved on your riding the most. Like maybe from a couple of years ago or coming into elite, like more like your technical ability. Like where has that progression? What does that look like? Oh, it's it's a funny one because I feel felt like my first actually elite years when I got injured, I felt really good and like. Uh, untouchable and then you have your first injury and I feel like the first injury is always the one that stops you and it takes a bit of time to like progress again and, and be here and then last year at the end of the season I was like great like I know what I'm doing mm. and then uh, coming into this season the racing got just tighter and tighter and it's also quite cool to see you know fellow riders like Anna Newkirk that I raced yeah. with when I was junior also being able to be at the podium now and the racing just gets tighter so yeah. you as a rider feel like oh i don't have a big gap anymore but i feel like everyone is just going that extra fast you know it, it was so interesting before we started recording you said that there's a bunch of women who are like too close for comfort now like new names who like you mentioned anna like who's impressed you the most this year Oh, it's everyone, Anna Newkirk, but also, you know, my training partner, Lisa Baumann. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, she only started downhill like two or three years ago. <laughs> and then uh, to see her winning European champs, kicking my butt, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first time she was faster than me. And then, like, also becoming super, yeah, competitive also. And, you know, is able to be at the podium. And uh, it's cool to share practice with her and then also be a bit pissed when she beats you in time training, you know? It gives, there's some fire now. Totally. It was a couple of the riders that have been around a little bit longer than the new wave that we know is coming, though, with Marine Cabra actually overtaking Tani for second overall. How impressive have they been? How close have they been to you this year? Because Marine's really, like, well, both of them, both really been on a comeback trail. Yeah, like, Marine is, is always there. Even if she's maybe not up in the, in the front in qualifying or semi, like, you have, you're not allowed to count her out for finals. So yeah. She always shines when she has to. Yeah. I mean, Miriam, everybody knows she's a true racer, like she's fighting it and she really wants it. To see her winning in uh, Ludendiel after that year off was really impressive. And the uh, same for Tani, you know, yeah. just because they're a bit older than us, they don't want to get uh, beaten by the younger generation. So uh, I think it's a cool mix of, of athletes now in the World Cup. And uh, I mean, next year there are some fast juniors coming up as well. So. Uh, well, it's going to be tough. <laughs> me and Elliot have seen a bit of that. We like we, we comment out on crankworks and stuff, where especially when you lot are racing World Cups and the juniors in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, I expect you know of them. You know the New Zealand. This, there seems to be, well, also with what, everything that's happening in women's mountain bike, like you say, the free ride movement. That's going to bring more women into downhill with new skills as well. Yeah, it almost feels like you've almost got to be a part of it, right? And that's what it feels like where, where you're going a bit. Yeah, I mean it's cool. Like uh, now I'm not the new generation anymore, yeah. so I kind of feel like, oh, I'm not the old one, I'm also not the new one, so I'm kind of stuck in the middle, but, uh, <laughs> in the sandwich, but uh, it's cool. I mean, uh, there's a whole new atmosphere and vibe that they're bringing, you know, you can see the girls practicing together and, and sharing, and even though they're competitors, they hang out and they're stoked for everyone, but at the end of the day, they're still great competitors, like yeah. nobody is, is giving a win away, and, and that's what the sports need, like, you can be selfish when you do your race run, but when you finish, you can be a great athlete and friend, I Totally, guess. yeah. I think that's the beauty of being in that position you're in right now, is, is you have that bit of experience, along with a little bit of personal expectation, I would imagine. But yet, yeah, you can still guide that, I don't know, the next generation as well. It's, it's pretty cool to see. It must be nice to be sat here after going back to the YT mob, right, where you all started yeah. and being world champion, World Cup winner, delivering for him. Must be a nice feeling, right? Oh, it's super cool. I don't think there are a lot of athletes who come back to the same sponsor they had before because no, I yeah. always feel like every time, you know, they part ways, there's always a weird uh, atmosphere. But yeah. uh, I don't know, I always was really good with them and it's cool that they also welcomed me with open arms and I was open to come back, so... It's do you, cool. Do you feel like you've made a lot of progress in that in that way? Like, I feel like as an athlete, a lot of the time you develop as a rider and you know get stronger and things like that. But you also kind of learn what you need to to race, like what kind of team you need. Like, oh, I should sign a three year deal because I can be you know more comfortable. Like, 
do you feel like you've kind of matured in that way as well? Oh, definitely. Especially if you're an athlete who wants to have things controlled and. Uh, you know, you're also growing up, you you probably, you know, we finished with school and then maybe you start university. I feel like for me, because I also study business administration, I think it's a cool way for me to learn from kind of both sides. And if you're an athlete who, you know, who doesn't need a manager, you can, you learn a lot, but maybe you also do a lot of mistakes. So sure. learn more from the mistakes. But I feel like now everyone is quite open to help you out. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, we've spoken a little bit, you mentioned Red Bull Hardline, the most formidable downhill race on planet Earth. Now you talk me into something. Yeah? <laughs> well, you mentioned it, it Valley. You mentioned it, but oh, we're going to see you there. I don't know if you can handle it, Valley. I don't know if you can handle it. You know, before the World Cup season starts next year, February, open invitation. You coming? <laughs> I guess so. Ah! <laughs> there you go. I think we're going to see you at well, Red Bull. Well, my mum is going to find out now. So, sorry, <laughs> yeah. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> Well, let's have a look at the overall World Cup standings then. This is how it played out in 2024. And you can see it there. So, Marine at Cabaru, Tani Seagrave riding injured today, slipping from second to third in the overall. But it's Valent. Look at the points lead you had, Valley. <laughs> ah, look at that. Massive. That's a good win. I mean, he did do it at the round before this one. So, yeah. But you've got to be happy. Total domination, eh? Yeah, it's a good one. I don't, I don't think I will get it more often in my career to like race the last race without any pressure. So uh, to do it two times in a row, I'm like, why is life treating me so nice at the moment? <laughs> but uh, I take it, I take it. And what's next? Where are you going next? Um, actually, I'm on the plane towards uh, Mexico. Ah, oh, yeah. Yes. Holiday time. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> how long, you, how long do you take off now after yeah. the season, Valley? What's your? Well, I'm in the races next year. They start quite late, but obviously I need to prepare for hardline. So <laughs> hey, we I'm heard it here first. In two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that that downtime for me was always like the like best part of after the race season. You know, you take November and you can really just relax. You know, like recoup. I think mentally you travel so much. You're even though there's a only a small amount of races compared to other sports. Like mentally, the travel, the preparation, and how much you have to be on is like so nice to just turn everything off for oh, a couple of weeks. Oh, And go right with your friends because yeah. I feel like that's what's missing the most. Totally. You're always away from home, so yeah. you can't yeah. wait to go yeah. back home. The good news is, Valley, that this vacation deal starts right now. Thanks very, very much for coming in. We're going to go and let you enjoy yourself. World exclusive, Valentina Hull will be at Red Bull Hardline <laughs> in Tasmania next year. Yeah, we've got the exclusive. <laughs> and from Valley that is going there for the first time to a man this year that came, saw and conquered at the world's hardest downhill. Our newcomer of the year is Ronan Dunn. And you might be thinking it's not his first year elite, but it's his first year with factory support. And the numbers really show the impact that that has made. He won his first World Cup. He got first in both Red Bull hardlines. He's currently sitting third in the overall, and he got a podium with the crash. He's always had a space in our heart, but now he has a space at the top of World Cup downhill. Oh. Oh. We got something for you, brother. What's this? So it's, it's newcomer of the year. Oh. And oh. <laughs> there hasn't been a rider that's broken into that like top three for a long time and you've like you won, you know, you've been on the podium, you went crashes, two Red Bull Hardline wins. So yeah, it's uh it's good to see. Yeah, no, it's been a pretty sick season uh with the new team as well. We've kind of had some uh, goals for this year and I think we've definitely passed them pretty quick. But uh yeah, wasn't expecting it for the fourth year of Lee. And uh no, it's a sick year. This is kind of your first year with factory support. Mm. And you've made this like huge jump up. It's kind of like you've gone into your newcomer to that kind of support. Mm. What has that been like? Yeah, pretty sick. Uh, definitely from the start, it was pretty mind blowing. And then like, yeah, from getting a 12th overall last year to uh, yeah, sitting in a third place for the last round, it's definitely jumped pretty quick. So pretty, pretty stoked with that. It's, um, yeah, it just makes a world of difference. And yeah, it's cool to represent a brand, like such a brand I've liked since a kid. So it's pretty cool to yeah, bring them back up really. Well, definitely a worthy winner. He absolutely gets my, my vote. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we saw him, people waiting for him to enter a section at a World Cup, a section, because he was going to pull the pin and do something that no-one else would. To see him now deliver full race runs and the consistency, I mean, I wasn't sure if it would ever come, but I, yeah, he's blown my mind. To win both Red Bull hardlines in a year and a World Cup, of course. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, for sure. I just, I just think we don't 
we don't see that often, and we don't see people back that up. And I was laughing, it kind of, and it kind of shows that where Finn was riding by, and he was like, you know, I heard you say that there hadn't been somebody that broke into the top three in a while. I, I did that two years ago. <laughs> so the you be careful what you say there. in the pits. Yeah, totally. But on that note, Emily, I mean, we do see that. We do see people get a win but kind of fade away. Like, why is it so much harder to have that consistency and be at the top for an extended period of time. Yeah, I think the mental aspect of it, of like almost expecting yourself to be able to perform there and then you push that limit and that's when those injuries and those constant like little mm -hmm. mistakes happen. I feel like he's not really pushed that boundary to make those kind of errors just yet. And so he's still kind of floating in his natural yeah. like element of comfort, but still just pure skill. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's always exciting to watch Ronan ride. That's why we love him. He's amazing. And while Ronan dominated Red Bull Hardline, it was a familiar French face that once again dominated the World Cup. And here he is then, the five-time world champion, a four-time overall World Cup winner who won it with one round to go this year, Louis Bruni. Nice, thanks for coming in, mate. Ooh. I feel like it's not getting any easier. You started incredibly strong this year, then we saw the return of the brilliant, sometimes uncontainable, of Amory Piron. Yeah. Some youngsters in there, and I guess, like, the weather as well. It's been a tricky year, or what's it been like for you? It's always a little bit tricky. It's never easy, to unfortunately. Win. This year was... Uh... A solid start, I would say, like the races were kind of consistent, good conditions, good tracks, and then from Val di Sol to now, so the last fourth, yeah. four World Cups, uh, we had so such an unstable weather, changing all the time, the track was always like different from the last practice run to the finals, yeah. and today was the same again, so um, Amori in these conditions quite excel, so he was putting a lot of pressure on the last part of the season on me. Yeah. And I was almost... He was. He was coming. It was coming hot. <laughs> yeah, he was. It was quite unbelievable to see. Especially was it? Leger. It was yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. putting the best show on mud I've seen in a while. And what did you make of that? I mean... I cried for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> for real. Like, Not uh, real. Yeah. You're in tears? Tears. Inside, <laughs> outside, everything. I was like <laughs> suffering and I was like... Were you honestly or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and, <laughs> and it was like... I didn't know that. No, it was upsetting because I, I really... I wasn't at the level he was. And uh, the summer break was quite a big uh, turnaround for me. I got fresher. I still got hurt, but at the end of the day, it got me away from the bike and I took three weeks off. And going to Worlds, I was back into my old self. And uh, well. the, the second part of the season was quite solid. So yeah. it, was, uh, it was a necessary break for me. And uh, I think at the end of the day, I, was, I wasn't riding as well as I was at the start of the season because of the conditions, but I was still there, so it was enough. Yeah. Loic, it was interesting to hear you talk about it after the race. Like, I heard the interview where you said you needed to get better in those conditions, like, work on the bike, work on yourself. Can you go into a little bit of detail of, like, what does that mean? Like, you've been riding for a long time. I know you train in the wet, but, like, how do you actually build your skills so that you can perform when their conditions are variable? Yeah. There's riding in the wet and spending your life in the wet, you know? Like, <laughs> I've, I have been growing up in the dry f since I'm young and 30 years old now, and I'm trying to, as soon as it's wet, change my mindset, enjoy more, like, have more fun, but it's difficult because it's like someone has been doing something his whole life and you have to change. It's quite, uh, it's quite difficult. I'm trying to learn from Finn mm. with that because he's really good in the wet and he's... Like, it's quite in inspiring with the way he approach racing in these conditions. He's, he's so confident, so it's quite difficult for me, but I'm really looking forward to... Uh, I'm trying every winter to get to rainy, cold places. <laughs> yeah. This is what happens miserable. Yeah. <laughs> when you live on the Cote d'Azur <laughs> in paradise, right? So exactly. sooner or later, it'll catch you out. That's pretty sad. I'm living <laughs> in the best area, and then I have to go to the shithole. <laughs> <laughs> and right and cold and wet, so I'm trying to do it. It's difficult. My crew is really <laughs> pushing me to, to do it. And Are I, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The team's, be, they're like, 
They're, yeah, yeah because they're telling the five-time world champ. You need to work on from that. my. What, what about yeah. bike equipment setup? Do you have to stress much about that? What does yeah, that look like have, in preparation? We have a bit of a. We have some, I think, advantages technology-wise on some aspects of the bike. But on tires, for example, we've been a little bit behind. I think mm. this year. Mm. Yeah. Fair. We had really good dry tires, really good intermediate, but no mud. Mm. And this year we needed the mud because it's one of the tires you only need in super extreme conditions yeah. that we've had. Yeah. And the uh, brand that we like specialize tires, they don't really sell any of these tires. Yeah. So they're like, okay, we'll make one now, but it's a little bit wait, uh, late, sorry. So now we're like, okay, we need a tire. We need a bike that's a little bit more um, forgivable mm -hmm. because in the wet, for example, today, for me, at least suspension and bike was a bit too stiff. So I had no grip. I didn't feel anything. So it was mm -hmm. a little bit of my skills lacking and the bike being a little bit, uh, made for higher pace and at the end of the day it's so small like that if you take one or maybe two for for me this today two seconds a minute it's nothing like you don't yeah. even feel it so yeah, yeah, it's yeah. quite it's quite frustrating for me like a performance like today i really didn't feel that slow yeah and uh but on it, a track like saint anne would you have wanted a, a more mud aggressive tire than what you yeah, had on yeah i think so because normally, like once it's wet, it's it's kind of running the same. I speed. expected the exact same feeling. Like it's wet, it's good here, but I don't know. Somehow this this year the track was really hard packed. We had no dirt. Yeah, we had no soft dirt, so the tire was just sliding around. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think we needed more like spikes yeah. to get in the dirt, and uh, I was staying on top too much. And you would make that trade off, like the rock that you do. You have that rock yeah. section, and that was kind of where the race was won and lost a little bit today. True. Yeah, I think the rock garden was. Uh, it was going to be a mission anyways, yeah, no matter right. the tires. Yeah, you just yeah, have to roll the yeah, tires. Yeah. Like, so if you could, you like the top done. section was quite important too. Like right. if you lose like three seconds at the top, you will never make it up to the bottom. So I think uh, if I had the options, I would have done it. We were a little bit, I really wanted to perform, but the team was a little bit, we chill and no data bike, no mud tires, you know, yeah. we're like, we go, but we chilling. Yeah, because you'd won the title, I suppose, uh, as well. Mm, what would you make hard. of Brosnan? This weekend, yeah. I mean, whoa, <laughs> huh? yeah, really, yeah. right? I did not see that. Did you see that coming? Um, well, yesterday it was quite impressive in semi-finals. So yeah, he was, but to do it again today. <laughs> today, and I think, oh, I wish, no, I hope that the track was getting worse and worse. Yeah, I, I said that, I said that. <laughs> I, I was like, when you, when you go and race and you come down and you're kind of the first place in the bad weather, you're like, there's nothing I could do. <laughs> but then like somebody comes and beats yeah. you and you're like, Okay. Exactly. Did, <laughs> did Menard but, go down before or after you? Way day? before. Way <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that later. <laughs> but no, um, I think the track was worse, so that brings Troy's performance even more to like yeah. something amazing. He was uh, not there in Ludonville, not there at Worlds, so I don't know if he had some freshness yeah. or a second win from being a dad, something amazing. I don't know, but it was, uh, it was impressive and I'm really happy for him because it's true, you know, he's always so good, second most of the time or third, always yeah. there. Yeah. And today it was like, I was like, I hope he's not gonna get second because he was riding one of those runs like quite epic. Totally. And then he got it, so it was really cool, even though I wish Loki would have won too. Yeah. And unbelievably, that result took him a second overall yeah. in the overall World Cup. It wasn't double points or anything today, was it? It's just mad to see him boost up like that because he missed a yeah. couple, right? He missed Ludonville, but you have to rem remember that Amori missed uh, today. So that was also why it happened. Amori breaking his hand just didn't score any points. But, you know, that was it. In the end, of course, you took the overall. Troy coming second. Amory, though, despite missing a day, broke. he didn't even crash, did he? just hit a tree. He yeah. took third overall in this year's um, World yeah. Cup. So yeah, You could see him going on the podium. He was, like, so lost because he was out of context. He was chilling today, and then he was like, ah, quick, jersey things. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah. It was interesting to me a minute ago, you say that your bike's, like, too harsh, perhaps, in wet conditions. Are we like, I've never heard anyone say that they can't sort of set a bike up between wet and dry. Are we in the specifics now of the sport? Like, are we seeing more like advances again in the technology and, and an advantage there? And of course, you you know, that might be an electronic advantage with a bike you've got, but talking to people that are racing you, they're like, a lot of people saying, look at that bike, like it's next level. It's a new generation thing. And quite honestly, I'm not sure I can compete with that on my bike. You know, that, that's a bit of chat now. For sure, for sure. I think it's, uh, 
especially the start of the season got some people thinking because we were quite uh, fast. So even Finn was really fast. So I think they really tried to find an explanation to that. And um, on the dry conditions, I feel like me, the combination of me and the bike are lethal. Like we have really like something so efficient and, and fast that I wish, uh, no, I'm happy I'm not someone else. You know, I'm not riding for another team or something because we have like, for me, the, the bike is so efficient yeah. that I, I have no excuses to, to mm -hmm. fail. I'm still like trying to learn huh. on the wet because we have, there's so many little things that needs, needs to work on the wet. Like a compliant bike will help a hundred times. And I remember like being on my alloy frame here a yeah. few years ago. It, in the wet, it's different. Like it's so much forgivable, and yeah. you have less feedback Softer. from the vibration vibrations. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to find excuses too because today I suck. Because Minar beat you in his last ever would World you, Cup. Would you ever like you talked about the frame and the frame? Would you ever have two different bikes, like a wet frame and a dry frame? Yeah, Jacko, Jacko, my mechanic is actually oh. uh, pushing for this. Yeah. Wow. Boys, yeah, the boys that specialize are. Uh, have a lot of work with us. We are a little bit picky, but uh, two chassis will be that's the dream. That's unreal. I've not, you know, I've been around this sport a long time, and that's never happened before. Has no, it? no, it's never yeah. happened. But I feel like Specialized is, is at a point where they really push for racing and yeah. prototyping yeah. bikes, and they don't really uh, care. They want <laughs> us to win, and they want yeah. to give us the the best they can. And I feel like it's it's possible for next year. So yeah. hopefully we we get there. I need help, so hopefully they send help. And uh, <laughs> You'll be there, mate. You'll be there. You're going to like this. This is how you won this year's World Cup, in a points breakdown between qualifying, semis and the finals. Let's have a look. And there it is. We kind of were looking at, you know, where did you guys do the best at? And it was really interesting that, you know, Troy and Emery actually, like, you know, won the quote-unquote overall for, for semis. Did it... Did you kind of notice that throughout the year where you were performing well? Went on in your semis, Luke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's not too bad. It's not, not too, too bad. bad. No, you're right. You're, you're right. You're close. You're right. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've been crashing a little bit in semis, to be fair. Yeah. I um, focus for sure more on finals, which is uh, where the big points are. I think it's where it matters the, mo the most. But. Uh, yeah. There's so many points, like it's so hard to be on top of, like three time runs are quite difficult. Is semi's gone next year? Yeah, is that, thankfully. You're, yeah, because I didn't know, is it a positive thing for some riders? Yeah. Some people did like it, right? But you mm, didn't. I didn't. No. I think uh, like Rudonville was only qualities and it was so good. Yeah. I think we don't need that many runs. I think it was like transition to the 30 riders final. And I think next year's idea is really good, but if we can avoid to ride that much, it's so tiring, like demanding yeah. mentally. We have to mobilize so much, like everything. Yeah, the, yeah, the staff yeah. is stressed out all the time. The pressure. Each and time. I th yeah, and I think uh, with semis, this year I crashed quite a lot in semis. So I think that that would explain it. In Poland, Val di Sol, Leger, I think. Like, you know, it was like yeah. difficult, but it also allowed me to correct it for the finals. Mm. And finals, I smoked them, so it's okay. Yeah, I think it's, it says something when you can perform yeah. right when it matters the most. Yeah, and this year, I think uh, it was my 30th year, 30th anniversary, I don't know, I'm 30 years old. Oh. And uh, yeah. the experience has, has been yeah, better. anniversary. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and I feel like that was a solid point. And even in, in Leger, I was seventh, and I was really mad. I said Amory was so good and stuff. It's but, been such a battle between you and Amory, yeah. isn't it? From the beginning, and you're, you've both, like, you're always there, you're consistent, and he... I mean, he has moments of consistency, but he has moments where he misses entire seasons with injury. Like, he is a completely different yeah. end of the spectrum to... Yeah, that's how it is, isn't it? There, I wish we could race more often. I also had my share of missing races. Mm. But, for example, in Leger, we had a meeting with the team and after Leger, and I was, like, trying to find solutions, and, they, and the team was so positive. Like, I oh, know you've been riding good, blah, 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 consistent, uh, smart. And then at the end of the day, it, it was quite smart. And Amouri is such a different rider. Uh, but at the same time, like, he's also able to perform when it matters and stuff. So it's, we level up every time at the end of the season. He was unfortunately coming back from a big injury last yeah. year. So the start of the season was a little bit slower for him. So that's why I think I made the gap then. And uh, if, yeah, missing the last race didn't help. But no. Well, let's have a look at the overall standings and how the World Cup played out this year after today's race here in Mont Saint Anne. And there's your top ten. 
world champion. Good to see. Well, it must have been a great day for you as Lotus Vergier's name there in 10th. Hey, to see yeah. a man who's almost your brother take a world championship yeah. title, all right? That must have been a special one for you. Yeah, especially me throwing it a bit away. I was like, <laughs> thank God it's Lotus who got it. Ronan done there in fourth. Won yeah. both Red Bull hardlines. I haven't, don't remember seeing you at one yet. It's, I know you want to come. Well, yeah. You want to come. Is, you're getting old. I uh, was at the first ever edition. <laughs> oh! Oh, you were! <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I was and believing you in the concept straight away. And, well, and you wanted to come this time? <laughs> yeah. Uh, apparently the hospitality wasn't there for you, I don't know. No, I was disappointed with Rob and I didn't go again. But I, I'm, Finn and I are planning on going to Tasmania. It's a little bit of a talk because we have a protobike, we don't know what it can handle, like it's quite difficult to convince Laurent and the team, but we're working on it. And it's been, especially Tasmania, it's been really mellow. So it doesn't look so hardline. Just saying. Like I think, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, think yeah, it's been yeah. it's been like quite uh, affordable, let's say, for riders. So it's if there's one that is good to do, it would be this one. Uh, the one in Wales is still quite extreme. So I yeah, you're right. That. That's how it is, mate. But next year the the schedule is quite tight, so yeah. we'll see what we can do. But I would like to do it. I think I I'm not bad at these kind of things, and I want to remind you that I can do this. You said to me, I want to show every... You've said it a few times. One day I'll get to Hardload and I will show everyone what I can do. Cos I know. We all go... <laughs> I can yeah, do we, know, so we know you can do... You can do that stuff in your sleep, but you you, don't, we don't see yeah, you do it. You love it. You love the pressure, so I'm not surprised you're, you're, you're hyping it up. Yeah, but sometimes I get caught huh, in my own game, so... Like... Hey, and it's been amazing like, to sit here and listen to you this afternoon, sort of saying, like, just sounding... There's no let up in how fiercely competitive you are. Next year, you're going to come back. You're as motivated as ever, right? You're as, sounds like you and the team are gelling almost better than ever. It's like, you know. I think so. Yeah. I, think so. I feel like today it was difficult because I was trying to dig and find motivation. Dig really deep, didn't find really, especially on these conditions. I was, I rolled a little bit against. Uh, I was forcing the hype and stuff, you know, like I was... Yeah, my you were trying was to build like, yourself up. My brain was chilling and my yeah. body was tired and I was still trying to push and it didn't work. But when, uh, when we come to races with a big goal and with stakes, you know, like with a lot of pressure on us, we... You're the boy. We're loving it. So I think You're next year we, it's going to be the same. We have Jackson hopefully coming back. We have like big boys uh, racing again. So it'll be good and I have a lot to... You're still the man, Bruni. You are still the man, mate. Still winning. It's been amazing to watch your career. It ain't over yet. Thanks very much for coming in. You dominated the season. And what a season it was. <laughs>undeniably an amazing season for Downhill. And I'm going to say the same about the cross-country season we had this year, Emily. What, what really stood out for you, if anything? Uh, I think the season as a whole and how diverse the winners were. Uh, both men and women, we saw six different winners. There was no not way. a prominent... Yeah, there was no one that was dominating this season entirely. And, and I think that's, that just shows the depth of how competitive cross-country is right now. Definitely. Yeah. Do you think, it's, do you think the talents like gone deeper since you quit a few years ago if you know can you notice a difference in it already i yeah, mean there's I definitely a new generation coming through there is a younger generation that's starting to prevail i think the winners seem younger i want to say it seems like a younger sport and we're, we're hitting those peaker ages at a younger time um but yeah definitely that diversity no one knows when they're coming to the line who's actually going to be winning on that day no that's right yeah and, and, you know, the last couple of races, the end of the season, we really saw Laura Stigger deliver some amazing results. Last week in Lake Placid, again a day in Mont St. Anne. Yes. Impressive. Yeah, I mean, Lake Placid, USA being the new venue. And we saw Laura Steger go from ranked eighth in the World Cup circuit with her first place and then again second today. She went from eighth all the way up to second overall. So spectacular to see her do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she's still only 24 years old. She is so young and 
had a little bit later of a start to the season down in Brazil, but once she started rolling in, in uh, Czech, yeah. she never she never left that top 10, so she was really, really consistent, Lara. Couldn't quite match Luana a day, but still brilliant performance, wasn't it? Yeah, you would said that it looked like Lara was riding better, but I, I actually thought the opposite. I think we both spotted yeah. that. It looked more like... Uh, Luana was in more control on totally. some of the descents. Well, it's interesting because, like, from my background in downhill, like, I saw a couple of clips of her at Lake Placid just, mm -hmm. like, nailing a lot of those fast, really technical yeah. sections. Yeah. It was the same here. You mentioned there was one moment where Laura kind of showed Luana maybe a line on the downhill to kind of that she probably shouldn't have. Yeah. And it feels like she maybe just isn't used to racing up at the front at that caliber where there are so many different things you have to think about. Yeah, I think Lara showed a few too many cards to Luana and Luana took that to her advantage and left a few doors open when she, when, it, when it counted on that last lap. Yeah. But I think it was Luana's uh, race to win, but still incredible season for, for Lara Steger. It absolutely is. And this is what she said after today's race. I am really proud already of this season, having a consistency and yeah, uh, being always in the mix for medals and uh, being in front with, with the fast ladies. Um, yeah, it was an amazing season and uh, to finish it off with a second place and second overall, um, it's, it's really nice. I think, Emily, you know, the way she's ended this season, we're going to see a lot more of Laura, Laura Stigger in 2025. Yeah, absolutely. She said it's nice to be up there with the top ladies, but, Lara, you are one of the top ladies now. You've proved that all season long. Yeah, absolutely. The confidence is there. Well, for our next award, we sent Emily off into the pits to find herself a late bloomer. Candice Lill may be a new name as a top contender, but this three-time South African Olympian is anything but new to World Cup racing. Back in 2009, as a junior, she was bronze at World Championships and have gone 15 years with never cracking, cracking into the top 20, but now ranking second in the elite women overall, earning herself Breakout Athlete of the Year award. You have been doing this a long time, and beyond the line, we want to identify and acknowledge uh, how far you've come. You've been doing this for 15 years. Crazy. Isn't it crazy? So we want to surprise you with this beautiful award from Beyond the Line. No ways! Yes, as the Breakout Athlete of the Year Award. Oh, thank you. I, this is like so unexpected. That's so cool. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. So you've been doing this for so long. What do you think has helped you break through this next chapter of your career? Oh. It's a really a number of things. As a as an athlete coming from South Africa, you it's difficult to break into what feels like a mostly European sport and to be in Europe and race weekend to weekend and to know the terrain and the feel at home and to feel like you belong on the start line, um, fighting for the the front places. So for me, it was just like that one breakthrough performance in Nova Mesto, and it sort of just like escalated everything <laughs> in my confidence in the way I race in. Yeah, just feeling like I belong there. Well, you've definitely got this figured out. So going forward, what are your goals in the near future? Definitely full World Cup season, whether that looks like a team setup or, again, my own setup. We're not quite 100% sure yet. But, okay. um, yeah, just looking forward to racing another full year and definitely going for the overall as well. Well, we're so proud of you, everyone at Beyond the Line, and we just want to wish you congratulations. Thanks for the award. <laughs> This is so cool. Isn't it sweet? I really that one, Emily, took her breath away. Yeah. <laughs> it really did, but but is, did I hear you say that she hadn't been in the top 20 for 15 years? Is so, that... Candace has been around, she's 32 years old, she's been around for as long as I can remember. We actually raced London Olympics together back in 2012. Oh, no why? Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time, and she's she has a 16th place at World Championships as an elite, but she's never cracked for a World Cup inside the top 20 ever. So to go and oh. she did lose the second overall and she did place third, but um, but holy smokes, like what a jump breakthrough. So the South Africans are coming. Well, Candice can be very proud of her accomplishments this year because when a certain Swiss woman is on form, she becomes killer Keller. <laughs>
And here is Alessandra straight from the podium, got her hands on her second overall trophy. Congratulations. Done the double again, the short track and the cross-country Olympic overall titles. You did it in 2022. Which was easier, this year or two years ago? Um, honestly, for me, it's been more enjoyable this year. Has it? <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I knew how it feels. And as soon as I knew we were still going overseas, um, I kind of thought to bring back the feelings from 2022. And Is then, that right? Yeah. So I tried to, yeah, bring these feelings back and then, yeah, actually make it here. Yeah? It looked like it worked from where we were sat, didn't it, yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell. It wasn't actually raining, but the track was definitely slipperier today than it than it looked. It's it's like St. Anne is always wet. Did you did you enjoy riding that slick ride today? Yeah, actually, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it kind of was dry in the forest, especially where like the loam was, but it was a bit slippery on the roots and in the like, um, let's say the rock section. So I think. To me, it's a proper mountain bike track because you need your like mental game also on point for the uphills and uh, like the technical section, the traverses and stuff. So I think, yeah, it was cool to ride. And you already knew you had the overall wrapped up, so you had a little less tension, I'd assume, coming into this race, or, or how did you feel? Yeah, I mean, I knew I already had it in my pocket, basically, but still, I'm a racer and I wanted to do, like... <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, I've, I've commented a few like, car bike revolutions this year. Yeah. When you say you're a racer, you're not, you're not lying there. Yeah. You've only got one gear, really, haven't you? <laughs> That's how it seems. Yeah, so I wanted to, like, leave it all out there and make the team and everyone proud and show the, proud and show the leader's jersey. That was actually the goal. So I found it, fight it until the very finish line. I think that's racing and that's how I race the races. Amazing. Well, we were watching from the TV and uh, it looked like Candace Lil definitely put the pressure. We were watching the time gaps. They were together and then 10 seconds and then together. Hey, and then and then 20 seconds. What was causing that little bit of a yo-yo effect? And, and, and did you ever feel like you were just trying to hang on to Candace or, or what was that like? Yeah, I think the yo-yo effect also was because she she was really good in the uphills. That's for sure. But I also knew I'm better in the downhills. So I left a little bit of space and then closed that gap in the downhills because when I'm stuck behind, it doesn't really make sense to put the whole super big effort to catch her in the, in the uphill. But yeah, I mean, uh, for sure that was the yo-yo effect, but yeah, she was strong in the uphills and I couldn't quite hold on. Otherwise, I like to have dropped her <laughs> in the uphills as well. But yeah, that, it, was, it was a good fight until the finish line, let's say like this. And apparently, because she beat me, she saved the third spot overall. Mm. Yeah. That's why she was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. She had a bit of extra in <laughs> the end. Yeah. Yeah. Extra it was motivation. nice to see Luana win again as well, her second win this year. But, I mean, she's a she's an amazing rider, but it was looking... She was under pressure in the end of the race, right? Stigger looked like she was catching her up on the descents as well. Yeah, I mean, these races, you need your physical shape for the uphills and you need your brain for the downhills, yeah. that's for sure. And yeah, it kind of, you can recover in the downhills, but still you kind of need to push. And that's like, yeah. And I know St Stigger's riding style and everyone's riding style who is like technically good to try to like make that gap yeah. closing in the downhills. But, yeah. but this, this here is, this is a proper, this is what you would call a proper cross country Olympic track, right? I mean, this Mont St. Anne, it's been around forever, but it stood the test of time. It's still one of the very best courses out there, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, I really like these races who are like, who are like um, uphill and downhill technical skills. So I think Grand Montana was also one of these races. Leger is very one technical. of these races. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so I, I really like that because, yeah, I mean, in my example, I invest a lot for, for technical stuff, not only the physical side, but I think you need to be an even more variated rider yeah. to be on a podium with races like these, even though it's really physical, this yeah. track. Yeah, that's right. When we were watching the XC, Elliot and I, this morning, and Rob, we, um, we thought Lecomte was in complete control. She was in the back and she was letting L Lara just kind of lead. Would you prefer to be in the back controlling the energy and watching your component or would you rather take the charge and lead and just put the rider behind you out of your mind? 
Uh, let's say, say four or five years ago, I would always be the one to go in the front and do the work. <laughs> I knew but you'd I say think, that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, as a complete rider, you also need to learn the ta tactical skills. I mean, the XO is one thing, but the XCC is the other thing. Like even there, it's even more technical, uh, tactical. And therefore, I think, um, yeah, I learned how to actually control from the back and then leave it there, out there when it's actually counting. It's really interesting to see you be so good at winning these overalls. I mean, two times doing the double. And we don't really see that many other riders being able to perform over the season. And some people kind of maybe focus on one race or world championships, you know. Uh, is that something that you really care about more, do you think, is winning these overall titles and being consistent? I mean, I also care about the titles, that's for sure. I mean, uh, winning is, is what, what actually counts. I mean, you forget so fast who was second and third, but you, you don't really forget about the titles. So for sure, world champ stripes, Olympic titles are what's counting. But I mean, I'm a consistent rider and I, it's just the health, the, you, don't, you can't get injured and like, you always have to be there and I, that's just one of my mindsets. I try to, if I'm on the start line, I try to perform and it actually worked uh, again. But still, I also would like to like win the big championships, that's for sure. But it's cool that it actually worked for a second time and I'm proud about that. Do you think that a different approach? Because the one thing, you know, I commented on the Oka cars, like I said as well, you don't miss a race. Other riders have missed almost entire seasons in their preparation for Paris. You didn't, like you say, your workload is actually unbelievable. Those are the races that you've done this year. Look how many compared to, I would imagine that's more than any other female athlete in the top actually, 10. Actually, I took note of this because as a North American, just every race is a whole week, week and a half, two week preparation. And I can't, you did, Cross country specific, 17 races. <laughs> so this is before doing six weeks in South Africa, which you were telling us about for a training camp. That's 17 races, that's, that's a lot of time on the road. And I compared it to say Pauline who did 11 races, Loana did 13 races. Do you feel like this many is sustainable? And, and, and you know, over the longevity, I mean, con consistently you've proven it to be. Yeah, but honestly, like, where I grew up or where I'm actually living, we are super fortunate. I mean, if you look at the races, especially the European ones, I stay in my own bed until Thursday morning and then I go to the race, I do short track cross country and Sunday evening I'm back in my own bed. So even the Oka nice. car you said, I arrived like, so often I arrived like Sunday morning and it's just, um, in my position, I can also do these races now as a training, and I well, think... Well, I was going to say, because it was difficult to cover. Was it Kua, where you, were, where you were training, literally training? You were going... So you'd be at the back on the flat in the town, and we'd be like, ah, Alessandra dropping back a bit here on the flat, then the climb would come, and you'd, like, go from 10th to 1st. <laughs> like, you were, and we were like, ah, she's back on the pad, and then on the way back down, you were chilling and, and going back to, like, 10th every night. I mean, it was quite unbelievable. You said afterwards you were training. It wasn't the easiest to commentate on, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. But, yeah, you no, just trained I... right through those races. I mean, but yes. that approach totally works for you. Yeah, it, it's like I, I take these races as a hard training, basically, and one thing is for sure that, you know, like, I try to be, like, for the kids, someone to look up to and yeah. just to be, like, a rider they, they can actually feel and they can see at the races because there's so many little kids yeah, racing there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm actually... Especially in Switzerland. Yes, especially in Switzerland. And my, my team manager owns part of the Öka car, so then we, like, going there and I try to be like a role mother for them. And you do. And also take some time for them. And that's also a reason why I go to these races. That's for sure. And uh, yeah, I mean, you said it, it's probably more than uh, Pauline, more races than Pauline did. But, Definitely, uh, Look, she... 24 races, 15 <laughs> XCO, 9 XCC. You know, that's, yeah. that's a lot, really. She, she only focused on, or basically only focused on the Olympics. And I think there will be other times where I probably have to do less races and focus on just one race to actually win it. But for this think, season, it was fine for me. Uh, do you think you could win Paris, the Olympics, 
like with the approach you've got at the moment when other riders literally will spend 12 months focusing? I mean, it's like some say there's no, you tell me, is there no better training than racing? But it's way more scientific than that these days, isn't it? North America, it's different because every week, every race is a, a two weeks, you know, in advance on the road. But it's different being European, like you're saying. Yeah, it's different being a European, especially being a Swiss person. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are super fortunate with these all high level um, races where I actually could go there on Sunday and then sleep so many nights in my own bed. But uh, as you said, I mean, the Frenchies, they already knew the year before they're going to go to the Olympics. And we got decided basically yeah. after Nova Mesto. That's right. So for us, the even make it to the Olympics is one thing. Yeah. And then you perform on these first three World Cup races and suddenly you're in the leader's jersey and you don't really throw <laughs> it away, right? Well, better focus on the Olympics now. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, it's right though, isn't so it? That's no, so but... true. And your country, there's no option. You have to qualify that hard because you've got so many riders. It's yeah. a fight. Yes. Huh. And I mean... Yeah, I just try to be a role model, be a consistent rider, be a healthy person. And I guess that being a healthy and normal person, or yeah, like, I mean, normal. You're normally. You're normal. It's just ride <laughs> no, a bike no, too that, much. Uh, <laughs> actually, um, yeah, um, results in, in being consistent. Yeah. yeah, let's have a look at these overall World Cup standings. There'll be a few Swiss riders in the top 10, no doubt there. But uh, look at that, yeah. At the top again, big, big winning margin, Alessandra. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Cena Fry in seventh. Actually, well, what's going on? There's a lot less women, Swiss women in the top ten than I thought there. Yolanda's been ill, unfortunately, and I think the peaking for, like, making the selection towards the Olympics also, yeah, uh, basically put us into position that we needed an early shape. And then, yeah, probably you... You need some some rest as well. So Absolutely, that's... yeah. You you mentioned rest. What is your plan for the off season? Uh, good point. <laughs> um, well, I for sure take a longer off off season. Uh, I mean, it's been we basically started in early April and now it's October, so it's been a long season. It's mentally demanding, or it was demanding. Um, so I'm going to take off season. The plan was to uh, first stay in North America uh, with my boyfriend, but then uh, we have a kids camp at home. So we're going to do this and then we just stay at home because we're not often at home. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a holiday. Yeah, yeah. So we just try to enjoy home and do stuff from there. Yeah. Well, amazing, Alessandra. You know, thanks for coming in. And it is an absolute pleasure to commentate at the OK Case. Your all-out racing style is like nothing else. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, Great to so see you. Cool. Thanks so much Have so for much success work. again. <laughs> well, earlier in the week, we sent Emily off to find a man who can talk nearly as fast as he can ride his bike. Our Race Comeback of the Year award goes to Christopher Blevins after he proved to the world what a man on a mission could look like for this American, passing a record-breaking 80 men after going from eighth place to dead last. We follow you. Hi, everyone. Oh, everyone's matching. Look at this. So come on up here, because I'm going to talk with you. So we at Beyond the Line have given you the award of Race Comeback mm. of the Year. Thank you. <laughs> Week one, you had won the World Cup opener. And then in the second race in Arusha, you had a wonderful start, but then had that mishap and crashed. And you went from top 10 to dead last. Okay, take us back to there. What was going through your mind when your feet were on the ground? Yeah, um, I think uh, I reminded myself to, yeah, be patient, be, be nice, but also not be nice when I was passing people. And <laughs> I mean, it was kind of comical that, you know, I was, uh, it was a dream weekend in the XEO in Maripora, and I had, you know, number one plate front row. And then it just shows that in sport, things can change so quickly. Um, yeah, I was bummed, you know, but like I said, it was a little bit comical that things can just flip that quickly. Wonderful. Well, this award recognizes the little stories amongst the story. And that one was so significant for us because it was a record breaking 80 passes in a World Cup race, which is so outstanding. You should be really proud of that. Well, from everyone at Beyond the Line and the rest of the world and your team, we're so proud of you. Have an incredible week and enjoy the rest of your off season. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, amazing to see him pick up that award there. Did you over, ever overtake 80 riders in one go? No. Um, I mean, standing in that room of that whole team was a little overwhelming at first. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Let alone 80 riders. Yeah, can't imagine. Incredible. Well, <laughs> he wasn't the only man, actually, to get a big award this year. You're going to stick around for this fella. He's double trouble. And here he is, the man that did all the winning this year, Alan Hathley. Congratulations on an insane year. Overall World Cup winner, world champion as well. Do you know how many riders have done that in the last 10 years? You're the no. third. You're the third. The other two, Nino Scherter and Julian Absalon. You are amongst the greats with that, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's been a stupendous year for you, right? Did you expect, when you started this year, for it to end up like this? No, I kind of, you know, it's something that I've planned to do over my career and it's just kind of like all happened in one go and it's, yeah, a bit lost for words and just honestly, it's just a dream come true and I think for sure I need a proper off-season to just soak it all in and process what I've done. But yeah, I mean, still lost for words, to be honest. I, uh, it felt like maybe a little bit into the season, something just clicked and you just started winning, you, you, just Back in April. In. Yeah. Start up yeah. in the beginning, nearly. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, what was it that, that this year, like, that that was just is so different from the rest of your your career so far? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it was an Olympic year, and we kind of shifted our preparation to be a bit later. Um, we kind of skipped all the early season races and kind of planned that from April onwards we really put the the work in. And yeah, it was kind of came a bit earlier, I would say, you know, pre-Olympics, Leger was kind of really the, the turning point in my season and obviously getting the, the double World Cup win, you know, the, the first time for, for me to, to do that and get a World Cup and win in the XCO as well. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of just build momentum from there um, throughout the rest of the season. And that yeah, kind of was another statistic that was also mentioned was, you know, I haven't been outside. Top three from yeah. Leger onwards That's uh, crazy. for yeah. every race. And fairly I've done. before as well. Like the consistency you had yeah. this year was unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, for me, straight yeah, away, what insane. you just achieved in in six seven mm -hmm. months is what people take a whole career to do. Yeah. Um, and we were looking at the stats of all the winners of the World Cups, and there's six different winners. So you got a chance to race with them all because, mm -hmm. like you said, you were pretty much in that top three for for five of those World Cups. That's on top of. World Championships and Olympics. Do you have anyone in particular that you just dread being up against? Yeah, I'd say Tom Pidcock for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very He's true, isn't it? Hard, a hard man to beat and uh, yeah, beat him once and that's it. I mean, the rest of the time I've been smashed by him, so. Whoa. Is he that phenomenal a talent, is he? When he turns up, it's, it's trouble. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's not the best starter, but you know, when he makes it to our group, you know, he has a, a big impact and he really, when he goes for it, it it's damn hard to follow. Is it? Do you, do, you, do you like him dropping in? Is it, is it like an extra challenge or yeah. do you wish he... You do, yeah. Yeah, you for sure we it. need the challenge, you know. It's always good that it's, you know, it's also a different challenge because he's not consistently rocking up, you no, know. No. He picks and chooses which events he comes to and it's, it's super exciting when he, when he does uh, rock up. And obviously, I think the, the spectators also, they want to see a different guy um, giving us a challenge and a potential different winner. So I think it's, it's really a cool element for, for mountain biking. Yeah, agreed, absolutely. And, and today, you went pretty much right from the start. Was that the plan? Yeah, I was a bit excited. You were, you were over 20 seconds up yeah, on lap yeah. one. We were like, yeah, whoa, yeah. whoa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, I mean, I, it was super strange, you know, like it, it wasn't the normal contenders around me in the, in the start lap. And, you know, I, I can't remember exactly. I think it was uh, Martin Blooms and Gunnar um, Holmgren was uh, the guys going into the first single track. And I, I saw no one else, like, in the overall was around me. And I was like, OK, if no one's keen for this today, like, I'm, I'm going for it straight away and did exactly that. And 
I knew it was going to be damn hard for them to, to catch me, especially on this course. Like the, it's more of a time trial effort. There's not much drafting, and, and to be in a group is actually more difficult. So. Yeah, is that right? And are you a yeah. fan of this? Is this the sort of track you love? Yeah, yeah. yeah like I won in under 23 as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so kind of also a bit of confidence in the back of my mind. And I knew that once I was gone, it was going to be, be you burn a lot of matches to, to get back in, in this yeah. race. and. When Matisse made the bridge, I mean, I knew I had to hit him straight away and just make an impact and did exactly that. And yeah, I'm just happy it worked out. I am. Um, I'm curious what your what your roots were before mountain biking. I've heard rumor that there was some motocross, but was it soccer, gymnastics? What did your like upbringing look like? Yeah, I mean, like originally it was BMX racing. With BMX racing. Yeah, and then transitioned to a bit, a bit of motocross and then like downhill. Like I really yeah. wanted to be a downhill. Bernard was in earlier. Yeah. Yeah. He knew yeah. you were coming in. He yeah. was like, yeah. ask him about his downhill career. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. thinks you won something at home somewhere. Like a yeah, title or something. Uh, national title. You did? Like, yeah, like and 12, downhill like 12 of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No big deal. To no big deal. Yeah, and no. Yeah. he also mentioned that your downhill career might have ended because you may have broken both arms in one hit. Yeah. No, I <laughs> broke the true? jaw, broke the right arm. Oh, like, did yeah. you? It was, yeah. No, it was like my child was just laced with injuries. I mean, like the BMX, you know, I broke the right femur as well. Oh. So did then you? my parents like, OK, motocross. And then like <laughs> one of my best mates smashed himself and OK, let's get you off of motocross. We'll go for the safer approach of downhill and then like smash myself <laughs> there as well. So yeah, yeah, not, Have you not had the easiest. Injuries in, in cross country? Yeah, both wrists. Okay. So yeah, yeah. it's not a okay. mountain biking's uh, not easy and it's uh, high risk, I would say always. But between, yeah, it's paid off. So. Between these main races, you were you were training at altitude, correct, in Andorra? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the last few seasons, I've used Andorra as my kind of home base. Nice. Um, yeah, after once the European season kicks off, I just go there and and base myself there, and it's it's super nice. The the riding, you just end up climbing all day and descending in between. It, it, there's down. no flats at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It works. It clearly works. So, yeah. 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 Let's have a look at the last winners of the World Cup overall since 2013, I believe, the last 11 years. See the sort of company you're keeping. Oh, wow. Look at that. Look at that. Nino had the last two before you. Mateus before that. Nino, Nino, Nino. Absol look, at, look at the company you're keeping. Yeah, that is incredible. That's crazy, yeah. That's pretty cool, eh? Super cool board as well. <laughs> I like to see. Yeah, that's are you, mad. Are you wrapped up for the season now, or are there any, any races left on the calendar? No, no, it's done. Yeah. You're done. I, I think, like, you know, a normal year, I would have just pushed on and done, like, some local races and just had some fun. But, like, for me this year, I've achieved everything. Like, I'm, I'm really content and happy to pull the handbrake and just <laughs> I just enjoy think so, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, Alan, you were, we were talking about it before, and you were saying how frustrated you were to not win last weekend and kind of wrap it up there and just hearing you talk about this race and you know you, you're saying I didn't see anyone around so I'll take it you know nobody's going to compete and you just hear the confidence in your voice yeah. you know it's uh can you feel that yourself like when you are up on the starting line do you feel like you could yeah. be going to win yeah for sure I'd say like I've really built the momentum like from the Jay onwards and the, the shape is still there like, I've just had so much energy, like, off the back of these races, and I, I don't think I'm an emotional person. So, like, when I achieve big things, it doesn't really sidetrack me at all. Like, I'm able to take, you know, two days to just kind of, like, wind down, and then I go straight back in again as to normal routine and yeah. training. And I think that's kind of been my key to my success this year, is that I'm just, like, constantly able to, to put in the work and, and keep the shape where it needs to be. And I knew that, you know, coming to a race like this, as difficult as it is here, that yeah. it really suited me as well, you know, like really greasy, technical, and just like a, a proper hard time trial effort, no drafting. So I just thought, proper track. this is it, proper we crack race. on. We yeah. finish off in a good way. I'd, I'd love to know just like the mental dialogue that you're like telling yourself from, from today, for example, yeah. what, what, what is going through your head? Like, what are you yeah. telling yourself when you went from the gun? No, I mean, I, I was a bit, nervous at first that it was you know maybe going a bit early that it was not like building the race a little bit and picking the right moment to really go for it and like you know the fact that they were chasing me down meant that i really had to like go for it for three four laps like to build the race and get and get the gap and then when matisse came across i was like okay let me just take a few minutes to recover and then i'm gonna have to do it again so for sure made the day harder than it probably needed to be but 
it's the last one of the season and I thought, you know, we're just going to empty the tank completely today. No, and I didn't you weren't going to not that. win that today, were you? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't no, no way, not in that journey. For sure not, for sure not. <laughs> no, that's all right. Let's have a look at the overall World Cup standards. You'll enjoy this as you're at the top of this as well for the season. <laughs> there they are, look at that. Decent win as well over Victor Koretsky. I mean, I feel for him a little bit this year. He's had a lot of second places, isn't he, as well? But, yeah. but you know, look at that. 300 points up. And then you dominated this year's World Cup. Colombo, Scherter down there in fourth. Yeah. All big names in that top ten, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. And I think it's, it's quite a unique one to have won this year. I think a lot of people focus on Olympics and purely Olympics. And yeah. The, you know, the rest of the season was kind of like a write-off for, for most. So yeah, I think was, the fact yeah. that I was able to like still deliver consistent performances around that like was almost a surprise for me as well, and I'm just yeah super happy that it worked out like that. So you did you didn't ex your peak was Paris, was it really and kind of or, or yeah I mean, yeah. Like most people's was right yeah but yeah to carry on like that if you in four years time. Will you change your approach and really try and focus even more on one big race? Or, you know, if you had a season like this, you might just do this again. Yeah, I think for sure I'll, I'll stick to what I know works. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really hard for me now at this point to think of, like, what I can do next to, to improve and level up. So I think that's pretty much what I'm going to be focusing on in the off-season is, like, you know, what's next and how do I go faster? Because, yeah. like, that's just how I am. You know, I don't settle for, like, where I'm at now. Like, if I win by, you know, 30 seconds, like, how do I make it 45 a minute? <laughs> no, that's, that, that, that's kind of, like, that's how I work. So, yeah, yeah. now I've got, some, got, who you are. Yeah, yeah. got some homework to do. And that's let's what see what we can do. That's what keeps you going, right? Yeah, keeps exactly, you exactly. Yeah, amazing. Listen, congratulations. We're going to let you enjoy your yeah. stripy jersey all winter long, mate. It's yeah. been incredible. Thanks so much for coming in, yeah, Alan. Cheers. And we're going to let you go. But not yet, because you will enjoy this. Here's yeah. some of the best bits of 2024. Well, I think it's fair to say that, you know, every year you think you've seen the best of it. It just keeps getting better. Cross country, downhill, some old faces, some retirements, but plenty of new talent coming in. I mean, it's just been another unbelievable year's racing. Would you it, think that, Em? Yeah, it, it has. I, I would like them to see, I don't know, maybe offer like a overall prize purse that's irresistible to not yeah. attend every single race for every rider. I would like to see that. That is super interesting, yeah. I, I think that it, this year was my first year really being introduced to that whole kind of process of, of peaking, skipping races, really focusing on, you know, this one four-year event. That was, uh, that was interesting, but I love that, that we got to see Keller take the double again. What yeah. about you, Rob? What was your uh, favorite moment of the year? For me, for me, actually, it was to see Amory Piron come back over a year out. I mean, he he broke his neck. I mean, it, you know, had surgery. To come back and win back-to-back -back World Cup races. But Val de Sole was one thing. I mean, the most gnarliest, mm. fearful track in the world. To dominate that, you know, that was one thing. But then Piron, a week later or so, was at his absolute brilliant best. To take this win in Leger by nearly six, over six seconds, wasn't it? I mean... Elliot, that's that's absolutely ludicrous. You oh, don't do that. No, that's that's I, yeah, um, yeah. that's inhuman. There it's not a, right. There was something on Instagram and like showing his run. I think it was the first time I saw the helmet cam, and I just posted that's the greatest downhill run I've ever seen in in uh, Val de Sole. I mean, and then to back it up, but like yeah, that's, that's right, insane. Historic winning margins back to back. Yeah, he's something cows, isn't he? Eh? Yeah. Right, we got to have a look now at our predictions we gave in the last show. We're going to start with cross country, so uh, it won't be me doing the press-ups this time. Oh. Let's have a look. OK. Oh, my goodness me. Right, I've decided that there's no forfeit, actually, as it's the last show of the year. Oh, uh, yeah? Oh, 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 oh. That's weird. That's weird that you're opting out of this. Yeah, let's just, let's just move on. Can we have a look at the uh, downhill? Can we have a look at the downhill predictions, please? <laughs> I should have fared slightly better, I believe. But you did all right there, Emily. Oh, <laughs> right. 
Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right, push up Let's to this right. run. Yeah, right. We're gonna, we better get out of it. We better get out of it. But there is, of course, still plenty left on Red Bull TV. Still, bike season isn't over. We've got two of the biggest events of the year starting on Thursday. Red Bull Rampage. And for the first time ever, Elliot, we're going to see women dropping in. Well, it, it's just so nice. I was on Instagram and I was looking and Chelsea Kimball was kind of giving an overview of her run. She's, she's finished with her line. You know, there, she's like, there's going to be some tweaks and working out the kinks, but it's really just ticking things off now for, for Thursday. I mean, cool. Emily, talking to my friends and them mentioning just how historic that this moment really is for kind of women's sports and women's cycling. In general, yeah, you're seeing women now on the Tour de France Femme. Yeah, um, but right. yeah, to see like Casey Brown, just to see the girls have a chance and opportunity to, yeah. to do this and show how capable we are in general mm -hmm. is pretty exciting. It's, it, yeah, it's brilliant to see. Absolutely amazing. I'll be tuning in. Don't forget, Saturday as well, the men go at Red Bull, Red Bull Rampage. And actually, a few days after that, me and Elliot will be putting on our sun hats and heading to Genoa in Italy for the last Red Bull Cerro Abajo Street Race Series, the first one ever outside of South America. It's going to be amazing, actually. We know how how insanely fast the South Americans go, the Colombians go, in their neck of the woods. What are they going to be like in Italy? A different track? That's right. Well, I, I think that it's really interesting because, you know, the street racing kind of had a bit of a, its origin in, you know, Lisbon yeah. and, and kind of in Europe, like the last maybe 10 years ago. But in those intervening 10 years, it's just gotten insane in South America. So yeah. to bring it back, I, I think the Europeans are going to be a little bit surprised at just the speed these guys are going. Yeah, the South Americans own it. Let's see what they can do in Europe. All those, that title's still got to be tied up as well. Well, Emily, I reckon the next time I see you, you're going to be a mum. Good luck channeling your inner athlete. <laughs> She's absolutely <laughs> trying to get out already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. No, and thanks for, you know, everything this year. It's been amazing yes. to work with you yes. again, Emily. Your knowledge and, and enthusiasm for the sport. Never dwindling. And, Elliot, I'm going to see you in two. That's right. I mean, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Rob. It's been such a pleasure. And thank you at home for watching. We'll see you next time on Red Bull TV.